In this video, I want to provide an introduction to the matrix formulation of econometrics, and I'm going to explain how, in some ways, it's beneficial over the way in which we've normally written down econometric models thus far. So the idea here is that let's say we have a model whereby we've got some yi, and yi is given by, let's say, beta naught plus beta 1 times x 1i plus beta 2 times x 2i all the way through let's say we have p independent variables so we have plus beta p times x pi and then finally we have our error term here epsilon i okay so one thing i want to mention about this is that this is quite a clunky way of writing things down i mean if i've got p independent variables i have to write down p expressions right i have to write down p of these particular terms here and I have to include on each of these terms a subscript i, where the subscript i here is implicitly going from 1 all the way through to the last point in our sample. So this is quite a clunky way of writing things down, and ideally we would like a slightly more compact and a neater way of writing things down. And it turns out that the matrix formulation of econometrics is a neat way of doing this. So what we do in the matrix formulation of econometrics is that we stack each of our observations on top of one another. So our top observation is y1, and then we have y2, and we sort of continue all the way down until we get to the nth observation of the dependent variable, which I write yn. And we can write this as being equal to another matrix, or this is a vector strictly, and we're going to write this in terms of a matrix, which I'm going to define in a minute, times a parameter vector. So this parameter vector here is going to have components which are just the parameter value. So its first value is going to be beta naught, its second value is going to be beta 1, and it's going to go beta 2 all the way through to beta p. And then finally, to ensure that we actually have the same dimensions on both sides, and to ensure that we've included our error term, I'm going to include here now a vector of the error terms, which, funnily enough, is going to start with epsilon 1, then it's going to have epsilon 2, and it's going to continue all the way through to epsilon n. So this error term vector here is n by 1, this dependent variable vector is n by 1, and this parameter vector, by contrast, is p by 1. So in order to make the dimensions of both sides match up, this thing this matrix here, which I haven't defined yet, better have dimensions n by p, because then what we have is we have a cancelling of the inner dimensions of these matrices, and we're going to be left with an n by 1 vector left overall. So what are the inner components of this particular matrix? Well, it actually turns out that it's quite simple to define. So if I write down the first row, the first row is going to have a first component 1, which I'm going to explain in a minute. Its second component is just going to be x11. Its, second, its third component, rather, is going to be x21, and we're going to continue all the way up until xp1. Okay, so why have I done that? Well, to see why I've done that, essentially what we need to do is we need to take this row and multiply it by this parameter vector here, because that's what you do in matrix multiplication, right? If we do that, we're going to get a 1 times beta naught plus if I can sort of write it in a different colour here, perhaps so you can see it a bit better, we're going to have x11 times beta1, and then we're going to have x21 times beta2, etc., all the way through to xp1 times beta p. So if I was to write out this first row explicitly, what we would have is we would have 1 times beta0, which is just beta0, plus x11 times beta1, which is just beta1 times x11, and then the second or uh, well, the third part would then be plus beta 2 times x21, and we continue all the way up to adding beta p times xp1. And then if we were to add on now the error term for this first row, we will then just get an epsilon 1. So writing out the first row in full, we'd have that the dependent variable for observation 1, y1, is equal to this linear combination of the independent variables plus the error term epsilon 1. So we've actually just recovered exactly what we had in the original equation, um, but we've just done it for the first row. So what's the second row of our matrix? 
Well, it's not hard to figure out. It's just going to be very similar, except now we're going to be talking about having, we're still going to have the first component being one because of the fact that we have this constant in our model. The second part is then going to be x, one, two, where the two here stands for the fact that we're talking about the second individual. The third part is then going to be x, two, two, and we're going to continue all the way up to x, p, two. And if you were to multiply out this row now times the parameter vector, we would recover the exact same equation which we had up at the top, except now we would have that y2 is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 times x12 plus beta 2 times x22 plus beta p or all the way up to beta p times xp2. Uh, and then finally we'd have our error term epsilon 2. So we've recovered exactly what we had before. So in general, what we would do is we would need to fill in this matrix for all n individuals. So the last row will be for the nth individual, and we will have the first component still being 1 because we've got this constant, and then we would have x1n, x2n, and then all the way through up to xpn being the last term in the bottom right of the matrix. And all the terms in between would be filled out appropriately. And this is a really nice way of writing down an econometric model because essentially I can write this all down as a matrix equation. I can write this down as having a dependent variable y or a vector which is equal to a matrix of independent variables which I'm going to call x with a tilde underneath it times the parameter vector beta plus this vector of the error terms which I'm calling here epsilon with a line underneath it. And I hope you agree that this down here is a lot nicer and a neater way of writing models rather than including explicitly all of these subscript terms here. Implicitly what we're assuming is that this matrix X contains all of our observations. So that's also kind of a benefit because of the fact that we're able to, for each different individual in our sample, we are essentially writing down that particular equation again and again and again. And because of that, it's kind of a complete way of writing down systems. And actually, this particular formation of econometrics, or formulation of econometrics rather, comes into its own when you're describing more complicated econometric models. And it's going to be our sort of forming a basis for all of our econometric descriptions of situations for the graduate course in econometrics.